thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right, so it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, but as Sophia mentioned, I'm a philosopher, a neuroscientist, a neuroethicist, so apart from the familial connection, what am I doing here? Well, whenever science and technology progresses, uh, can do new things or make new predictions, inevitably questions arise as to the appropriateness of some of them, or maybe their just distribution. So should ventilators and iron lungs be used to keep people alive indefinitely? Should we use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit the germline? And now, what are the ethical implications of plasma profiling as the technique develops? For all of these questions and many others like them, we do not have to reinvent the wheel, luckily. Um, formal ethics has been studied at least since the time of Aristotle. Um, and Bertrand Russell famously considered the history of Western philosophy to be but footnotes to Plato. Uh, but the context around the philosophy changes, and somebody has to take this philosophy, understand the context, and apply the one to the other. And this is the field of bioethics that I've come to love. So my previous work has been in data ethics, uh, trying to find out ways to facilitate the ethical use. Um, the first paper here is developing an argument that if you can share data at little or no cost to yourself, then you should. It's called the duty of easy rescue. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's basically it. And uh, you can see here maybe a family connection again. <laughs> um, I've also been much employed in trying to dig up, brush off, and make sexy this long forgotten human right to enjoy the benefits of the progress of science and its applications, together with uh, my father, of course, and my mother. Some of you might also uh, know George Church, who's an active member in our reading group. Um, but today, I'm going to point to some areas in which plasma profiling nudges up against the ethical territory, or the bioethical territory. The hope is that uh, if the field gives these issues enough thought in advance, internally, then there will be no need for external people like myself, or worse, regulators and legislators, to come in and do the job for you, uh, with all the associated burdens that that might have. So, as Philip mentioned, there are some categories of information that we might not want to be broadly or easily or widely accessible. This is especially important for a technology that aspires to be widely used and perhaps one day be routinely used in the clinic. For example, much has been written about gender-blind interviews and techniques for so-called gender masking. And famously, the Vienna Orchestra and others since the 70s have provided screens for auditions, uh, at least preliminary rounds. Where these are put in place, uh, it increases the chances of female auditees by f some 50% or more. So what would an equivalent for this be in plasma proteomics? The problem is much greater where pregnancy is concerned. Pregnancy discrimination occurs when a woman who is either visibly pregnant or suspected of being or soon becoming pregnant, is fired, not hired, receives a pay doc, or otherwise negatively impacted solely due to her status as pregnant. And indeed, this is no small concern. The United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Article 11, explicitly prohibits dismissal or other kinds of discrimination against women due to pregnancy as a human rights violation. But it's the general thing here that we are interested in, what we are worried about, the kind of information that could be used for discrimination, not only in employment, not only in insurance, but also in private life. It is already possible to tell not only one's gender and pregnancy status, but perhaps also ethnicity and various lifestyle factors, in addition to the health and disease status that are the primary aim of plasma proteomics. Thus, we should ask ourselves in advance the general question. What do we do with sensitive information that is not directly relevant to the health-related purposes of the test? And what about factors that are sensitive, but also potentially might be health-relevant, such as evidence of alcohol or drug misuse, or indeed ethnicity and pregnancy? Another category of ethically sensitive information is any data that can be used to determine the identity 
of a person from a sample. This slide shows the results of a study done by uh, Philip and others in which the plasma samples of 43 individuals were analyzed over the course of a year. On the top row, you can see the subjects labeled 1 through 43. Samples were taken for these individuals at five time points over the course of a year. The graph highlights proteins which are distinct between individuals. For example, you can see that the levels of this orange protein, A2M, are quite constant over the year for one individual, whereas the total levels vary widely between individuals, as highlighted here in the red circles. Indeed, some proteins, like GDI1, are specific to certain individuals. This means that the, yeah, and in fact, some 70% of proteins, uh, according to this analysis, are specific to individuals. And that means that they may be used as identifiers for those individuals. The same potential is shown here in a separate analysis using the same cohort. The starting point here is that individual specific proteins have been calculated for each individual in the cohort. Then, the sample taken at the first time point is compared to all the other samples in an effort to determine which belong together. In a comparison of 252 samples, there was only a single mistake made in matching. Similarly, when applying the same idea to a different cohort of bariatric surgery patients, it's not shown here, there were only two mistakes. These results raise important questions because identifiable information is treated quite differently ethically, but also under the law and in regulations. Ethically, we might have some of the same worries over identification as we might with genetic or other similar databases. Who should access them primarily? Should the police and or justice system or your physician or specialist have access? What about other researchers or your family members even yourself, or private investigators. Perhaps more important in the immediate future is a, I think likely, scenario in which plasma samples become recognized as samples holding sensitive information about an, about an identifiable individual. And in much of the world, including the US and the EU, special regulatory structures exist to deal with this kind of samples. In the EU context, that includes the GDPR. General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, came into effect last year and is an EU-wide update on the previous Data Privacy Directive. Since the GDPR is a regulation, it is, its provisions are directly and legally binding on all the EU countries. And a significant chunk of these provisions is relevant to research on identifiable data or material. It's really worth thinking about this ahead of time since plasma samples certainly carry sensitive information and, as we have just seen, can also be used to identify a unique individual. I think it better to start a dialogue internally in the field and maybe even try to develop some guidelines than it would be to be made to adhere to GDPR restrictions ex post facto or even risking having some study lines temporarily or permanently shut down. Important factors here include the storage of the samples, encryption, aggregation, or otherwise, of the results, and, of course, informed consent. Now, it may be some time before regulators catch up to you guys, but they will, eventually. <laughs> and it is really better to begin thinking about this first, so you can have people that understand the field making the first drafts that usually end up uh, becoming guidelines in not much modified form. Right, to achieve even greater certainty in identification, one could also use allele matching. Uh, in this study, also carried out by Philip and others, the MZ ratio of peptides was used to determine allele status. What they did was construct a database that includes the most common alleles in contrast to the normal FASTA file, which contains a reference proteome with only one allele. Then, five individuals provided four samples each, which were analyzed and compared to the pre-blinded sample. And in each case, the alleles clustered together such that all samples could be easily sorted to individuals. And using this procedure, there were a grand total of zero errors. Alleles are also useful in that they can deliver important health-relevant information. 
To take an example, let's talk about the ApoE gene. ApoE3 is a benign variety which nearly everybody has. By contrast, ApoE4 is the largest known risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's, and in fact increases your chances of receiving late onset Alzheimer's disease by some 30 times. On the other hand, ApoE2 results in an increased risk of cardiovascular, di cardiovascular disease, and I am told by my girlfriend, who's a neurosurgeon, also does a lot of problems for traumatic brain injury, as well as increasing the bad kind of cholesterol. Let us uh, let's imagine that the plasma test has been some plasma test has been undertaken for some reason, and this has nothing to do with apolipoproteins. Perhaps we have had one done while checking if we have gotten pregnant, or to check whether we are indicated for a certain treatment for a certain disease. However, the results reveal not only the information we came for, but also other important information. And to stick with our example, let's say that's about our apoE allele status. Or alternatively, we have come to check on our ApoE status and found out that we are pregnant. What should the person who interprets these data in the clinic do with this additional information before telling it or not to the patient? This is a really important question and one that should be addressed ideally at the point of consent. This is so because people do not necessarily have the same preferences when it comes to knowing good or bad news. For example, there is not much you can do about the situation if you have one or more, God forbid, ApoE4 alleles. There are no medications that decrease your risk, and your best shot is simply living healthier. In other words, it's a health-relevant finding, but not a very actionable one. On the other hand, ApoE2 is actionable, as one can take statins to reduce one's risk of a heart attack. Thus, that kind of information is both health-relevant and easily actionable. In other areas where similar questions come up, such as incidental findings in imaging or in genetic tests, the distinction between actionable and unactionable information is often seen to be crucial. Many proposals and guidelines in those fields will essentially amount to a statement that unactionable information should not be returned, whereas actionable information should. This makes sense to the extent that someone who did not know that they had ApoE2 alleles could then change, modify, their lifestyle and begin uh, taking statins, and this presumably would be a very good thing for their health. Similarly, the plasma profiling community needs to think about developing, ideally in consensus with the whole community, guidelines on how to proceed when important information not directly related to the study questions are nevertheless found in a sample. Ideally, the consent pro process could include a statement to the effect that such findings do occur, and that the team would like to know the preferences of the data subject in advance. A third category here is uh, data of uncertain significance. Perhaps some variations in a key metabolic pathway have been discovered, but whether they are deleterious, benign, or even helpful cannot be ascertained. Should this be disclosed to the subject or even to their physician? In general, the answer from other fields seems to be no. But that then raises the question of what to do with stored data that originally was of uncertain significance, but due to the progress of proteomics, we have found out what significance it does have. Do you then go and trace old subjects? What do you do? In summary, with results such as those Philips have shown, and with the pace of progress increasing, I believe it is high time to start fielding and discussing ethical questions. This is so not only because doing the right thing is important, but also due to the fact that external people, likely regulators or legislators, will eventually do it for you if you don't do it yourself. And they may not be as likely to come up with fair and balanced and understanding regulations as the collective wisdom of the profession might. So if you want to avoid ended up tethered to myopic regulations, you had better start thinking ahead about these ethical questions. Thank you.